There was a time when thinking a little too hard got a man in trouble. That's next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with evangelist Kevin Presley. Today I want to go back and look at one of the colorful stories of the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul said that the things written aforetime were written for our learning. And I can't think of a better example than the one we want to study today. The story is about a powerful and famous man by the name of Naaman. And the Bible introduces us to him by telling us that despite all of the impressive things about his life, he was a leper. Now, leprosy was an awful disease in that day, and it was a sure death sentence for anyone who contracted it. But God would heal Naaman, but not before quite an episode took place. The story is found in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, and the text tells us there, beginning in verse 9, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Now, thinking is typically a good thing, but here's a case where thinking nearly cost a man his life. And we'll look at his story in a moment. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Naaman was a decorated captain over the army of Syria. He had won many battles, and as you, as you can imagine, his position brought him wealth, a recognition, authority, and a big ego. Naaman was accustomed to giving orders, not taking them from others, and that includes God and his prophets. He, he was surely accompanied much of the time by an entourage of servants and soldiers, and his life wanted for very little. One day, though, everything changed. Uh, something didn't look just right. He, something appeared different on Naaman's body, maybe a quick glance in the mirror or a casual glance down at his hand or his arm, and he knew that something was wrong. A small sore or canker had come up on his skin, and it looked suspicious enough to cause him to catch his breath. And sure enough, when the doctor looked at it, his suspicion was confirmed. He had leprosy. Now, that's how the Bible introduces us to Naaman, a man who lived a life of wealth and luxury and power and privilege, but the Bible utters the dreaded phrase that changed everything. But he was a leper. That's how his story is introduced to us in 2 Kings chapter 5. Despite his great valor, despite all of the things that could be said about him, 
The Bible says, but he was a leper. And that just cancels everything else out. Now, leprosy is one of the most dreaded and grotesque diseases in the history of the world. It's a disease that attacks the flesh and literally rots it away. And if the symptoms of leprosy showed up in a person, the priest was to decide if it was indeed leprosy or some other disease. Uh, because of the need to control the spread of this incurable ailment, uh, the law required that a leper be isolated from the rest of society. The leper was required to wear mourning clothes, to leave his hair in disorder, to keep his beard covered, and to go about crying, unclean, unclean, so everyone would know what he was and avoid him. And the result is he would die a lonely and excruciating death. It was an awful way to suffer and die. In fact, there was no cure for leprosy, none whatsoever. If a man was healed, it was because of a miracle from God. Now, leprosy is a type or a figure in the Bible for another disease, uh, one far more serious, the disease of sin. And you know, sin afflicts the human heart and has the same characteristics as the fleshly disease of leprosy. It's an interesting comparison. Uh, leprosy was an extremely contagious disease the most casual of contact could spread it from one person to the next. And of course, that's how sin operates. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 that by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. And that's simply telling us that sin got its start in the world and in the human family through Adam. He and Eve were the first to transgress the law of God and everything changed the moment that they did so. They polluted a perfect world. Their sin corrupted the earth, all of creation, tainted because of sin. And as a result, even today, every human being is born into a world that is marred by sin, that has been touched and ruined by sin. And the Bible says that all of us have sinned. As we reach the age of accountability and we choose between that which is right and that which is wrong, we all become guilty sinners in the eyes of God. And there are a number of horrible consequences that result from that. Worst of all, James chapter 1 and verse 15 says that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the final penalty of leprosy physically and sin spiritually. You see, with leprosy, there was no surgery, there was no antibiotic, there was no drug that could treat and cure leprosy. If God did not heal it, you would die an awful and excruciatingly painful death. You know, that's also the fate of the sinner, every sinner. Uh, that's what all of us deserve. Sin is not only the cause of the curse of physical death, but even worse, it's the cause of spiritual death. The Bible speaks of the second death, and that simply means that the person who dies in his sins will be separated from God and be cast into hell eternally. Now, that's a serious proposition. And I'd ask you today, how do you look at sin? How do you look at your sin? You know, too many people look at sin, especially their own, very flippantly. They shrug and go on their way unconcerned about their severed relationship with God and the eternal fate that awaits them. And you know, any person, I'm convinced any person who looks at sin that way is not looking through the eyes of God. Sin is incredibly serious in the eyes of a holy God. People don't even begin to understand what an awful thing it is to be lost. Ezekiel said, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin are death. And Paul also said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on they who know not God and obey not the gospel, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. A pointing forward to the final judgment of the whole world, John said in Revelation 20 and verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friend, you can't afford to ignore your sin 
any more than a leper could forget he had leprosy. And I can promise you that Naaman's life changed the very instant he knew the dreaded diagnosis. He couldn't push that out of his mind. He couldn't afford just to go on as though nothing was wrong. He knew that he was a dying man. Now the Bible tells us that he had a young Israelite girl living in his house who had been captured in one of his battles. Uh, he took and made her a servant to his wife. Now this little girl from Israel, she believed in God. She believed in the God of Israel. She believed in the prophets of God. And she had every confidence that if Naaman could just meet the prophet Elisha, that God would heal him of his leprosy. So she told him about Elisha. And boy, Naaman was excited about that. He jumped at the chance. Here was a man who was desperate for healing. And time, money, effort, didn't matter. He was bound and determined to go see this miracle worker, Elisha. Now to make a long story short, Naaman gets the king of Syria to write to the king of Israel to set up a meeting with this prophet. And when it's all said and done, Elisha hears about it and sends for him. And I think it's right here that we really get our first true glimpse at what Naaman was really like. Naaman, as would you or me, Naaman begins to, begins to imagine this meeting and what was going to happen when he got there. He, he rehearses this in his mind. Now, he may have been a leper, but he'd not forgotten who he was in the eyes of the world. He was a very important man, and I can assure you he expected to receive the royal treatment. And the Bible tells us in verse 5 here of 2 Kings chapter 5 that he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. Now what that tells us is that Naaman was intent on impressing the people of Israel. Despite his ugly leprosy, he was going to flash his money around and whether or not his motive was to impress or just out of desperation to obtain a cure, the fact is he missed the point. Now I'm told what Naaman took with him to Israel amounted to a lot of money. In fact, they say those 10 talents of silver would be worth about $160,000 today. That his 6,000 pieces of gold would be worth about $2 million. And those 10 changes of clothes, they weren't for him. They were expensive garments that were considered an impressive gift. It would be like giving 10 Armani suits to heads of state today. Naaman was determined to be cured, you see, but little did he know what was really in store. A great surprise awaited him. You know, that reminds me of how we as men and women let ourselves think about salvation today. A lot of us think we can impress the Lord. Oh, I do a lot of good deeds. I give a lot of money to charity and to the church. You ever hear somebody talk like that? They may say, well, you know, I, I know I don't assemble with the church like I should, and I, 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 I'm not really a devout Christian in that sense, what you might think of as a devout Christian, but oh, but I'm a good person. And I do all of these good things, and surely that counts for something. Surely the Lord will let me in because I'm all around a pretty good person, and I do a lot of good things. Well, it's important, all right, that we do good things. But the Lord isn't impressed, you see, with our show of goodness. And if a man thinks that he can buy his way into the presence of a holy God in his sin, that he can somehow win God over with all of his good deeds and his charity, he's in for a huge surprise. Your own righteousness and my own righteousness amount to nothing in the eyes of God. It's righteousness that comes from the gospel. It's a broken and contrite heart and a life dedicated to loving God and keeping his commandments that God is looking for. So already Naaman's thinking is different from the man of God's. And when Naaman offered Elisha these gifts, Elisha refused them. And you should know that you can't buy your way into the favor of God either. But now see what happens when Naaman gets to Elisha's house. It's interesting. In verses 9 and 10, the scripture says, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, this is not what Naaman was expecting. 
He wasn't anticipating this. It was a shock to him. First of all, I think it's significant that Elisha sent a messenger unto him. Well, what's the deal with that? Well, Naaman expected a personal encounter with this prophet of God, you see. After all, Naaman was an important man, and it must have bruised his ego for the prophet to send a mere lowly messenger out to speak with him. I mean, Elisha didn't even go out and acknowledge the man. He just sends a messenger out to speak to him. You know, in the same way, I think a lot of people are disappointed in the way God speaks today. And what I mean is they seek salvation expecting some grand abstract experience. Oh, they're looking for an encounter with God. Uh, you don't have to look very far to find folks who will claim that God has personally spoken to them or that they've had some kind of dream or vision where the Lord granted them the forgiveness of their sins or some other blessing. But that's not how God reveals His salvation plan to men today. Uh, people want to have an experience like Saul on the Damascus Road. But what they forget is that Jesus told Saul in that experience to go into the city and a man would come to him and tell him what he had to do to be saved. Now, you know, a lot of folks aren't satisfied with that. They want a religion that involves inner voices, fuzzy feelings, heavenly intuitions. But you see, God's salvation is very simple. God's salvation is found in God's Word. Uh, the gospel is not in men today. The gospel is in the book that inspired men wrote. Paul says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And if you would be saved, don't look to an experience, look to the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Or verse 16. Now the second thing that I think disappointed Naaman was what the messenger told him to do. He, he plainly tells him that if he would be cleansed, that he was to go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times in the water and he would be healed. Now, you know, there was nothing vague, convoluted, or physically difficult about what Naaman was commanded to do. Very simple. So simple anyone can understand it. He simply says, you go down to the Jordan River and you dip seven times under the water. Now, now could you believe the Bible says that that made Naaman angry? I mean, Naaman got mad when the messenger told him, if you want to be healed of leprosy, you go down to the Jordan River and you put your head under the water seven times. Now that would sound strange, I suppose, to any of us if we were in Naaman's position, but it makes him angry. Why? Well, the reason is found in three little words here when he says, behold, or but I thought. You see, Naaman already had this thing all figured out before he got there. Listen to him now. He says, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. You see, he expected it all to be a big ceremony of some kind, and the fact that he had to go and do something so humiliating, so humbling, that made Naaman upset. Did you notice that what Naaman thought didn't involve any obedience or effort on his part? That stands out here. It was all about what Elisha was going to do to him. Listen, he says, Surely I thought he would come out to me and strike his hand over the place and call upon the name of his God, that he would recover the leper. Men are no different today. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all they who obey him. Now Jesus is the author and provider of our salvation, but Paul says it is conditioned upon our willingness to submit to him in obedience. Now my friend, the plan of salvation is no more difficult than God's remedy for Naaman. Uh, God has simply required that sinners believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, according to John 8 and verse 24. He demands that we turn away from our sins in repentance, according to Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. He expects us to confess Him before others, Matthew chapter 10 verse 32. And He commands us to be baptized in the likeness of His death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of our sins. Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, and so on and so forth. 
And in fact, in that transaction, we are made free from sin, according to Romans the sixth chapter, verse 17. But there aren't any plainer verses in the Bible that are found than what are found in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, where Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And in Acts 2 and verse 38, where Peter said that everyone, everybody without exception, must repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He says, Every one of you repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Yet multiplied millions of people don't believe that. Millions of people who profess that they believe in Jesus Christ will argue with the very plainest of Christ's commandments and say a sinner can be saved without it. In fact, I've had people get very angry, just like Naaman, over the fact that the Bible says they must be baptized in order to be saved. Well, let me ask you something about that. Does getting mad at the truth change the truth? Suppose I step on the scales and... Um, they ask one of us to step off, and I reach down and I pick up the scales and I smash them against the wall. Well, do you suppose my suit will fit any looser the next time that I put it on? Well, you know, in the same way, fighting against the truth doesn't change what the Bible says. And one day the scripture says in John chapter 12 and verse 48 that we're going to be judged by what the Bible told us to do. Jesus said, uh, we have one that judges us in the last day. The words that I have spoken unto you, they will judge you in the last day. So the Bible says Naaman was angry. Now there was another misconception in Naaman's mind. Verse 12 tells us that Naaman asks this question. He says, Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. Naaman is asking the same question that so many people ask today. What difference does it make? I mean, Naaman is thinking about a number of rivers that perhaps were cleaner and more convenient, perhaps more expedient. We've heard that word in religion. Oh, but this is expedient. The Bible may not specify it, but this is expedient. Well, let me ask you this, and I want you to be honest with yourself. What if Naaman went down to the river, Abana, and he waded out into the water, and he dipped seven times? Now, the way we typically reason things Water is water, isn't it? I mean, anywhere you go in the world, water is water. Uh, isn't the act of dipping the same in one river as the next? I mean, is it really that material, what river I go to, as long as I perform the action that I'm dipping seven times? So what difference would it have made? What would Naaman have been if he had dipped in the river of Anna? If he had chosen some other river in Israel and gone down and very carefully made sure that he dipped himself seven times. What would he have been? Well, you and I both know what he would have been. He would have been a wet and angry leper. Now, why can we see that in the case of Naaman, but we have such a hard time seeing it when it comes to God's will today? Does it make a difference what God says about salvation or about the church or about our worship? Won't one way do just as well as another? That's what people tell us today. Well, my friend, it made a difference for Naaman. And it makes a difference today, too. Jesus said, They that worship uh, the Father must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Now, take a look at what happened here to Naaman. The story's not over, thankfully. His servants were watching him throw this big fit, and they finally approach him with some common sense and some reason. They say to him, uh, Naaman, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he says to wash and be clean? In other words, Naaman, if Elisha had told you what you wanted to hear, if this had all happened like you had it imagined in your mind, well, you would have gone away from here thinking that Elisha was the greatest preacher in the world. And isn't that how a lot of people measure preachers today? They love a preacher that will agree with them, pat them on the back, tell them everything's all right, validate their lifestyle. But they don't necessarily love the preacher that tells them what they need to hear to be saved. 
They asked Naaman. Now, Naaman, if you would have accepted his word in one case, why won't you accept it now? Can't you see, Naaman, this is just your pride getting in the way? Well, I got through to Naaman. I think he stopped and he realized what a predicament he was in. And he realized that he wasn't in any position to be given, giving orders to others, and neither are we. You see, our sins have left us to bow before the mercy of a righteous and holy God. Why fight against him? Why shun his commandments? Why try to explain away his word? And friend, if you've not done so, won't you humble yourself and submit to God's will today? Be baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you haven't done that, I hope you will right away. The psalmist said, through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Our time is gone today, but if you'd like a free printed transcript of our lesson, But I Thought, get in touch with us, and we'll get it to you right away. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and check out our website, letthebiblespeak.tv. And tell somebody else about Let the Bible Speak, and the Lord willing, we'll plan to meet you back here next time for another study of God's Word. Until then, have a wonderful week, and may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.